Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is the Ukraine War Frontline update for the 10th of May 2023. Before we go to the frontline, let's just dip into the Institute for the Study of War, American Military Think Tank, a bit of their preamble. They are discussing Prigozhin. There's going to be a lot of talk about Prigozhin today uh, for a number of reasons. He was saying he was going to pull out by the 10th of May. He's going to pull out the Wagner troops to be replaced by the Akhmat Chechen fighters. That never happened. He got the ammunition. He was kind of trying to leverage there. Uh, the ISW says Wagner Group financier Prigozhin seized the Victory Day holiday as an opportunity to mock Putin and questioned his judgment. I hadn't seen this before, so this is a significant. Prigozhin referred to a quote, happy grandfather figure who, quote, thinks that he is good during a discussion of ammunition shortages and Russia's future prospects in Ukraine. Prigozhin then rhetorically asked what Russia and future generations should do and how Russia can win if the grandfather turns out to be a, quote, complete asshole. Prigozhin also noted that unnamed figures likely referring to Putin and the senior Russian MOD figures should stop showing off on Red Square. Prigozhin is likely referring to Putin, who is often regard, referred to as grandfather, or more specifically, B uh, Bunker Nyi Dead, or Bunker Grandfather. And Prigozhin has previously attacked other senior Russian officials and officers by name, but has not done so against Putin. Prigozhin has previously attempted to upstage Putin's authority through similar rhetorical stunts. Prigozhin's escalating attacks on Putin may, if the Kremlin does not respond to Prigozhin's thinly veiled criticism on, of Putin on Victory Day, further erode the norm in Putin's system in which individual actors can jockey for position and influence and drop in and out of Putin's favour, but cannot directly criticise Putin. Prigozhin announced that Wagner forces will not withdraw from Bakhmut by his previously stated deadline on May the 10th, despite the Russian Ministry of Defense failing to provide Wagner with additional shells. Uh, and actually, well, there are claims that they have provided the required ammunition. Uh, it's all a bit of a hot mess, I guess, isn't it? We will return to Prigozhin in a second. Let's go to the front line. We'll go initially to the northeast sector, the Kupiansk to Svatva to Kremlin front line, uh, that looks like this on a war map. A map on my map that looks like Kupiansk there, Svatva there, just the top section of that at the moment. There's been talk about uh, activity in Volshana. I showed you some mapping changes the other day where the Ukrainians had taken back some territory here just by Volshana, Volshana and Persia Travnevi. If that renders, uh, the uh, ISW says of this sector. Uh, no, it doesn't because it's not working. So nothing seems to be working. Ah, com computers. Right. The ISW says uh, not a lot of the whole front line. Indeed, you know, it doesn't really mention anything about Vilshana, which I find interesting. It says Mazyotivka, which is quite near unsuffsuccessful Russian operations in Mazyotivka, uh, Stelmakivka and Bilohorivka, which is much further down south um, and operating near uh, Makivka. We'll have a look at that in a second. So Mazyotivka is just there, just to the north of Liman Pershi. But we do have claims, Rebar says, in the Kupiansk sector of the front, artillery drills and positional battles continue in that area, Hrani Kivka. The Ukrainian command deployed additional forces to Dvorichna in order to strengthen its defensive positions. So it goes on to talk about Bakhmut after that. It's saying, well, the Ukrainians have put more troops in this area for defensive reasons, whereas we seem to be getting the impression that actually they are doing some offensive moves in that area. Indeed, let's go and look at here. So unconfirmed reports, forces took over Vilshana. I mean, I haven't, haven't seen anything about that elsewhere. I've not seen that reflected in mapping, uh, but it could be that the Ukrainians are now in Vilshana. That's something to look out for over the next few days. Okay, moving on uh, further to the south. So that's uh, interesting claims there. We have, uh, it talks about geolocated combat footage on May the 8th and 9th shows elements of the 30th separatized motorized rifle brigade uh, operating near Makivka. That is here, so the Russian 30th separate, separate motorized rifle brigade strikes a house in Makivka at this uh, 
coordinate set of coordinates. So let's go back to our map and we'll go to Mikivka. Uh, pop down that front line past Svatova. Uh, really not a lot of activity and then a uh, striking of a house in the Mikivka area. Not really sure this tells you an awful lot other than they are trying to take out positions there. I mean, that, that just confirms that the Ukrainians still uh, are in control of land where we think they are. And then really it's a case of coming down to uh, further down uh, to Kremina area activity in Bilohorivka, which is further to the south here. Uh, that Bilohorivka, there is one a little bit further south of there too. Uh, and it's a case of then getting to almost to, uh, well, yeah, to Bakhmut already. So we move on. Uh, as I say, not a lot of activity along that sector. Russian forces, well, if we go to War Mapper first to give you an idea of what they think, uh, there have been no confirmed changes to control since the last update. That is in the center of Bakhmut. There have been changes outside. As according to Deep State Map, so if we come to my map of Bakhmut, remember I have, I try and map the two extremes here. So Deep, deep State Map is a pro-Ukrainian mapper in yellow. Syriac Map is a pro-Russian mapper in red. Quite a lot of difference still in this northern area around Orikovo, Vasilivka. But as we come down here, there was a big change yesterday from Deep State Map. So Deep State Map appeared to indicate the Russians had taken a massive amount of ground here. Actually, it's just rejigging their map as far as I could work out. Their map is now almost entirely in line with uh, the Syriac maps through most of the interior of Bakhmut. So I think they hadn't done much mapping over the last couple of days, and I think they were just catching up, and this is why they they appeared to show a, a large amount of ground being taken by the Russians, like really quite a bit here, but actually I think it's just map rejigging. Syriac maps uh, claims that there's a tiny bit of uh, control taken by the Russians in the northern area. They made small advances around the Olympic School and captured the post office. Meanwhile, uh, from the southwest, southwestern axis, the Ukrainian army launched a counterattack and recaptured a significant area west of the water channel. And that is referring to this. We'll come on to speak about that in a second. Uh, let's go back to ISW. Russian forces continue to make marginal gains for, within Bakhmut as of yesterday. Geolocated footage published two days ago now indicates that Russian forces likely advance within western Bakhmut. Let's see what that footage is. This is of fighting around a building, Tchaikovsky Street. Um, and there seems to be quite a, a lot of activity here, advancing, indicating advances for the Russians as according to ISW. And yep, that building is indeed in Russian hands, uh, or at least according to the mapping, that's two days ago. And that was, a, I think, a little pocket of uh, Ukrainian resistance was holding out there is now under Russian hands. So that seems to be fairly uh, kosher as far as what ISW is claiming. They continue, Prigozhin and Russian sources claimed yesterday that Ukrainian forces were conducting high Mars strikes on Wagner-operated prison facility near Bakhmut. That is what has been claimed uh, by reporting from Ukraine a couple of nights ago as well. Indeed, what uh, reporting from Ukraine said in their video last night was that HIMARS hammered uh, ammunition depots and all sorts back here, all, all in the uh, in the rear of the Russian uh, line, and that possibly took out uh, a whole lot of supplies for those troops. And apparently, there was supposed to be a big Russian attack uh, that just didn't happen because, as according to reporting from Ukraine, because of the 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 effective use of the high Mars in that area so that is a pretty significant outcome uh, there have been there was um, a move of one group who was fighting previously in Kromova that was moved down to fight in this area and I'm going to talk about this area in a second because there's been quite a lot of movement there um, but let's just go back to ISWC what they have to say so 
Uh, Cheravati reported eight clashes in the Bakhmut area, so that's not very much at all. There's not a lot of activity from the Russians, possibly suggesting that recent claims of intensified Wagner operations in and around the city are not reflective of a sustained effort to increase the tempo of operations. The Ukrainian general staff reported uh, that Russian forces conducted unsuccessful operation, offensive operations within Bakhmut and near Ivanivska, so that's to the south, Chavzivyar to the west, and Stopochki, sort of southwest. Um, so these are uh, Russian forces conducting unsuccessful operations around here uh, towards Chadzibyar. Uh, so you know, the usual kind of places. Uh, and uh, and let's see what Reba has to say before we talk about what happened to the southwest. So battles continue in Bakhmut where Wagner PMC's assault groups are pushing the remaining Ukrainian units out of the western quarters of the city. I don't know that that is continuing to happen actually. Each assault is preceded by massive artillery and airstrikes in order to save the lives of Russian troops. How uh, how magnanimous. Um, Ukrainian units southerly try to hold back the attack of Wagner PMC with indiscriminate artillery fire. One of the rockets hit a Ukrainian POW holding facility, according to preliminary reports. There were no casualties. Uh, despite the holiday, uh, Ukrainian units continue to shove Donetsk. Okay, well, right. So, as I have mentioned, there has been quite a lot of activity, not too much movement inside Bakhmut at all. In fact, I would say that other than what Suryat maps say uh, in terms of a small amount of territory being gained just here, the post office was mentioned. Uh, this is told, uh, told Bahina Street. There's been quite a bit of activity here over the last sort of four or five days. Uh, there, there was limited Russian gains there. But it's really all about what took place in the southwest, uh, which is near to the canal here. Um, and this is a canal coming down, as you can see that gray line there. So let's go now to, uh, Pr uh, to Prigozhin to see what he has to say about what took place. And I, I uh, talked about this in the news piece this morning. Um, so sorry for repeating myself. This is another angry Prigozhin rant. So he says, that's why our, the, our army is fleeing. Uh, it is fleeing because today the 72nd Brigade, so these are conventional Russian troops, has lost three square kilometers where about 500 of my guys died uh, because it was a strategic bridgehead. And they, the 72nd Brigade, just took off and fled. As you heard, the blue and torch the blue anal torch gazprom pmc so the the gazprom mercenaries uh, that kind of special ass plug um he's not very uh he's not very nice to them they fled just like the second 72nd brigade that's a fact and he, he is angry so what happened well according to re reporting from ukraine and uh as we'll see several uh, several other forces the ukrainians pushed back here and this was all under the control of the Russians, the, the Ukrainians pushed them back here and across the canal. As you can see, uh, pro Ukrainian mapper, deep state map has uh, the Russians pushed back to the west of the canal in this area more than uh, the pro Russian mapper Syriac maps. And let's look at a few other sources we have here. Uh, the leader of the Azov movement, Andriy Beletsky, uh, states that Ukrainian forces of the 3rd Assault Brigade liberated uh, some land. Let's see what he has to say. Um, right, he said, Glory to Ukraine, I report, as a result of the offensive actions of the FU's 3rd Assault Brigade, units of the 72nd Brigade of the Russian Armed Forces were defeated. So this is the same uh, brigade that, that uh, Prigozhin said ran away. The Practically the 6th and 8th companies of this brigade were completely destroyed. Brigade's reconnaissance was defeated, a large number of armoured vehicles destroyed, and that is uh, borne out by the stats that the Ukrainians gave for armoured vehicle loss, APC losses this morning. Uh, 18, I think they, they claimed. A significant number of captives were taken, and the so-called third assault unit of Wagner PMC took significant losses. Hostilities, I mean... Prigozhin says they, they took 500 losses. Uh, hostilities took place on a strip three kilometers wide and 2.6 kilometers deep. The whole territory is liberated from Russian occupational forces. Um, and it, it, he goes on to sort of 
say thank you very much to the people he's fighting with. Now, there is uh, footage here. I don't want to show you a couple of dead Russians and whatnot. Uh, the tanks running over trenches with Russian troops in them, in the tree lines. So for two days on the southwestern outskirts of Bakhmut, the soldiers of the 3rd Brigade as part of the Azov Tactical Group liquidated 64 invaders. Another 87 were seriously wounded and five Russians were captured. Several ammunition depots, mortars and several IFVs were destroyed. Now I'm going to show you uh, part of this that just um, it it does bear out exactly what... Oops, I had to get my external mouse because my computer's stupid. Uh, it does bear out what Prigozhin was saying, which is a well, th there are a whole number of vehicles that were that were blown up, and that that supports what the general staff were claiming about Russian losses this morning that I I mentioned in my news piece. Now, when we hear Prigozhin talk about troops running away, the seventy second uh, running away, pro Russian voices could say, "Ah, oh, he's just saying that because he's having this argument with." with the Russian MOD, yada, yada, yada. But actually, we've got we've got uh, evidence of them running away quite quickly. In fact, in quite a few places uh, in this video that we see Russian troops running away, uh, vehicles getting blown up. I think there's, there, are, there are more troops later running away. No, that, uh, there's some other footage I've seen of them running away as well. So this everything that Prigozhin says appears to be borne out by these sorts of claims and there are there are more claims as well here from and this is quite a long one a long but interesting update on Bakhmut uh, and from uh, this particular source let's delve into that this guy's uh, call sign is actually YouTube I believe and there you go now, to talk about the ammunition situation, so Prigozhin apparently was given ammunition and then apparently that was then rescinded and so he, he doesn't have ammunition again. He is claiming that uh, they are being flanked, the, the Wagner, they are lacking ammunition. Of course, the HIMARS may have also taken out ammunition depots there. Uh, and here, the Ukrainians had already had a counterattack around this area maybe a month ago. Again, reporting from Ukraine talking about this. The Wagner took a took a beating here in the 72nd. And they're talking about, you know, we are being flanked because there's no protection from the flanks. Uh, so on and so forth. And then we get uh, this chap here saying, uh, Wagner is retreating. We're advancing. Wagner's men have no ammunition. We have plenty. Putin is in a panic. What to do? Interesting. But it goes on to say there's no such thing as these headlines. They are just stirring up the whole Ukrainian people and everyone thinks that we have already started to win. He's, you know, that a counteroffensive is coming and we are moving forward and they are already retreating. There's no such thing like that. So I'm asking uh, that the media outlets not to make such headlines. Uh, what do we... Uh, so what do we make uh, happening on the 9th of May in the Bakhmut sector? We will go in a circle from the north. The news said that the enemy started attacking Minkivka. So that's up in the, in the north there. I want to say the line of defense in Minkivka has not changed. The enemy has not come anywhere. Uh, I mean, our defense is very strong there. Then we go to the north. That is a road through Kromova. A few days ago, the enemy was already behind the road uh, a few hundred meters away. They are now behind the road again, but the road remains impassable because they are close to the road. In Kromova, our men also are also standing. There are no movements, so the defense is strong. The enemy is already in Bakhmut from the north. They have to send their reinforcements as much as possible to get from the city to the north. But during one day, they only went 20, 30 meters in Bakhmut itself. There is no movement on the part of the enemy. They have not moved anywhere in several days. The only thing that our troops did last night was to take back a couple of houses about 35 to 50 meters away. We went forward and pushed the enemy back. And this is how the battles go. They cover with artillery, hail, hurricanes, and... Uh, this is the the vase we also cover their infantry with artillery hail uh, further the, uh, so i'm not quite sure if that translation is on point further the southern part of the city and up to kostantinivka there are movements on our side in some areas there is even it's this line our forces have pushed the enemy back in some areas two to three hundred meters 250 meters some 50 meters so the line of defense has moved 
not in favour of the enemy. We are pushing them as far as possible away from the road that runs through Ivanivska. And I want to say that the road is still very dangerous to drive on because it is our cars that are hit on this road, not from the side of the landings to Ivanivska, but from Bakhmut, from the city. There is Troyanth Alley and they put ATGMs there and they can, can catch cars. It's a shame, but they hit our cars and blow them up. We're already hunting for them to catch this ATGM guy. I think we'll catch him and neutralize him soon. And uh, I want to say that fight, uh, that the fighting itself it has been so stagnant for several days, it's not going so hard. The fact is that they are probably rotating some reinforcements that arrived and they have started to replace the Wagner rights uh, because they recently took uh, the uh, position from the Katsaps. There were nine Katsap bodies. One of them was a Wagnerian and eight were regular Russian army soldiers. So we can say that one Wagnerian simply leads the groups because he knows where to go and is more experienced. He leads these groups and there are eight people there. And so it goes along the entire front line. Maybe they are being withdrawn uh, no one knows for sure, but this is a situation. I mean, they have less manpower in Bakhmut itself, and they are afraid that we will launch a counter-offensive in Bakhmut. So they cover the, all their positions, a lot of plantings, well, all of the surrounding areas where we can stand. The time fires, again, not sure about the translation, the surrounding areas, they cover them very heavily with artillery and with hurricanes. So hurricanes are the... Um, multiple launch rocket systems it's very scary hurricanes cluster rockets they hit manpower so you can imagine how our infantry can stand there if they just dig everything up with hurricane rockets it's very difficult it's such a critical situation it hasn't gone away it's very scary i want to show you some more recent footage of what bakhmut looks like and then i'll tell you what i uh, what can happen to bakhmut next let's go and he shows sort of lots of footage uh, and then he says so sorry this is quite a long one but i think it's it's fairly uh, useful and important. He goes on to say, there's nothing left of the city. It's all ruins. Uh, very difficult to hold defense and to attack in such conditions. There are two options for what will happen to Bakhmut. Firstly, we can roll back a few kilometers along the front line and hit the enemy with a counteroffensive on their flank so that they leave the city themselves. Second option is that we don't roll back but use our counteroffensive to knock them out of Bakhmut direction and move forward. Both options are realistic. But what will be the result? What will happen? It's up to the command to decide either uh, this way or that way. But it will be very soon. And I want to say that I respect our infantry um, who withstand all these rocket attacks because they are the reason why the defense line is holding. Um, so on and so forth. Now, so he's saying that there will be a counteroffensive. It's whether it's flanking and you leave them to run away themselves or you kind of fully push through and, and take it out. But that would have been said yesterday. And I, I guess since then... This counteroffensive has been successful in taking even more land and and destroying Wagner uh, Wagner troops and uh, conventional Russian troops as well. So uh, th that's a bit of a, a summary of kind of what's going on from different sources. Uh, it does look like there is a change in momentum, possibly. Uh, well, almost certainly, the Ukrainians are are pushing back. There was. Um, some mapping realignment here from Deep State that hasn't been reflected in Syriac maps. And this is where uh, the Russians took control of some of the trenches I was talking to you about the other day, but I didn't change my mapping to reflect that particularly. Well, because Deep State hadn't done that, and this is kind of a reflection of Deep State and Syriac here. Uh, I've got Ukrainians further back here, more defensively speaking, but uh, but Deep State has reflected that. So that this, and your chap, you just you were just listening to there said it is tough in Kromova. they're really close to the road it's impossible so you can't use that road and, th and that will be you know because the russians are indeed in this area just to the north of it uh there right okay so here we have uh tendar saying the russians lost one bridgehead over the seversky donetsk canal south of bakhmut so again it's just confirming what we have have heard since uh, for weeks the ukrainian soldiers of the terror unit have been decimating russian troops at bakhmut's southern flank uh, the russians tried to send armored vehicles but were repelled and uh, there you go some kind of geolocation of some of that activity and here um, another source saying the Ukrainians have advanced some hundred meters southwest of Bakhmut. So if we put that together on my map. That's to say that there is activity just around this area, as well as further to the south uh, along here, and that the Ukrainians have pushed the Russians back to the east of the canal there. Anyway, uh, that is the activity for Bakhmut. I 
did I cover everything in um, ISW? Yes, I did. So uh, we can move on further to the south, but it's certainly something to keep an eye on uh, there because it, it. I don't know. It does seem like the Ukrainians have are starting some kind of counter attack. Uh, around Bakhmut is whether whether that will take place inside the city or or on the flanks to try and force the Russians to pull back. It seems eminently sensible that the Ukrainians have hammered the Russian logistics and supplies and ammunition within Bakhmut. High Mars have been brought to bear and they are really useful for precision and devastating um, strikes like that, but aren't often used directly on the front line in that manner, but it appears that Bakhmut has has called for that usage. As we come further down south then, and we we pop along past sort of New York and Tourette's, and past these northern areas of the Avdivka air, um, sector, Krasnoharivka, Novobakhmutivka, they see, it seems to have really settled down around Avdivka over the last uh, three or four days, at least as far as the Russian advances are, con are concerned. Russian forces continue limited offensive operations around that area. General staff, Ukrainian general staff saying unsuccessful attacks around Pervomysky, Avdivka, and it goes on to Marinka. Ukrainian forces likely made uh, marginal gains in a recent counterattack southwest of Avdivka. Geolocated footage published on two days ago uh, indicates that Ukrainian forces likely made further marginal advances north of Vodzhanye in an area where ISW assesses Ukrainian forces conducted a limited counterattack as of April the 30th. ISW has previously assessed that reports of Ukrainian counterattacks throughout Donetsk appear to be part of an ongoing pattern of localized and limited counterattacks. This is reported here where the tanks of the 1st Slavic Brigade of the Russian Federation show Ukrainian positions uh, near the settlements of Vodyani and Spartak. So these are Ukrainian positions. So Ukrainian con Ukraine control these positions that we're just about to look at now. Um, and we'll geolocate that. Wow. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, I'm, God, mm, I don't, yeah, I'll be a little bit unsure. Is that correct? Ukraine controlling positions being shelled by Russians there? Surely not. Um, oh, that's a position. Sorry. Oh, that, that's where the tank is. Sorry. That's my stupid uh, understanding of what was going on there. And that is... Oh, a cup of tea. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and that is actually hitting a position there. Okay. So that... that my bad. That confirms that the Ukrainians had taken this land back that uh, that had been reported previously, and it's confirmation of that. I was going to say, if, if the Ukrainians are way down there, things are really going well. Um, okay, so that is the geolocation that we have for this area from the ISW. It goes on to say uh, of... Of the rest of the Donetsk sort of area, Ukrainian forces likely conducted a successful limited counterattack in western Donetsk Oblast. Geolocated footage published on May the 9th indicates that Ukrainian forces conducted a counterattack near Novodonetsk and made marginal advances in the area. This refers to here where they have let's uh, translate that that says uh, the 37th omsr of the russian federation fires at ukrainian positions four kilometers from novodonetsk let's see if there is a, a an advance for the ukrainians we are going to do my favorite part of the day again which is geolocating okay so we're coming out there and this is oh it's okay I'm going to come on to that a little bit later. So that is really on the outskirts of Donetsk, uh, and that is reflected in the mapping. But just before from um, Deep State Map, but just before we get there, uh, just to say that yeah, that's that's the end of Avdivka. As far as there is no more news about any uh, exchanges of territory, it seems to be fairly stable there, stabilizing a lot. Marinka as well. It just gets that single mention of unsuccessful repelled attack there. And then we are moving to Vukhodar, no real mention of that. Uh, so we come on to one of the only other territorial uh, changes, uh, mapping changes, a deep state map had, which is this area. There's suddenly the Ukrainians were just further down south. Now, I don't know if this is that they've taken this area here. I mean, it's not that much of a difference. It's literally like the, the previous lines were sort of going along there. 
and they seem to be just you know a few fields further to the south that could be one of these examples where they haven't taken land in the last 24 hours but there's footage now to show that they are in that land uh, and so it's shifting the maps because we, it, they just weren't accurate before. It's hard to know along the whole thousand kilometers of who owns what field and who is in which position. And sometimes these things change without without people knowing, or you just draw a line from A to B, and you think that between A and B, it's just one continuous line that that is, you know, you've got evidence that people are at A and people are at B, and so you draw a line between those two. But actually between there it could be up or down there's just no confirmation of where troops are and then suddenly you get some geolocated footage that suggests that actually there, there's a position between a and b that that is further south of that line or further north of that line so that is how the kind of mapping works and this could be that the ukrainians haven't attacked they are just in positions there that are being that that, that are being geolocated um so anyway that's what's going on uh, around around the rest of donetsk Indeed, concerning uh, Zaporizhia, there's not a lot to report. It is uh, yeah, still active in terms of artillery duels. Um, the ISW just says Ukrainian forces, uh, sorry, Russian forces targeted Ukrainian positions west of Hulaipale and in Kherson Oblast. So west of Hulaipale, there's Hulaipale. Somewhere west, um, they've been hit with artillery. And, and that's all you've got really from Zaporizhia. I get a sense that there's lots of things happening in Zaporizhia area. But there's quite a bit of operational security for obvious reasons because there's going to be a counter uh, offensive, counter attack taking place in that area imminently. I would guess. But we'll go on to to mention Kherson, and I've got a bit of footage here. This is of Bereslav of a got of one of these glide bombs, the FOB five hundred bombs, and how significant these are as munitions. So here we have. Um, uh, Boroslav, which is, and you can see the damage that that bomb does, is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and then, and then another one over here. So, think, look at all of these buildings, the, all of the work that goes into building this stuff, and just destroyed. Just war is so destructive, horrifically destructive. Um, all that time and effort, and these are this is where people worked and lived. Anyway, so it looks like three. Uh, three FAB 500s, uh, I assume, have been uh, sent into Bereslav here and caused quite some significant damage. So you can see how those types of munitions take out the buildings in Vukhladar that have been basically um, only merely scratched, if you like, by artillery. Yes, they're pretty wrecked and the they're fire damage and so on and so forth. But structurally, they, they aren't challenged by uh, artillery. But these FAB 500s are significant munitions. Uh, ISW does make reference to that, uh, says that geolocated combat footage published on May the 9th shows elements of uh, Ukrainian defense brigades, sorry, Russian defense brigades shelling Ukrainian positions on uh, the like Potemkin Island. A Russian mill blogger claimed that Russian forces repelled a small group of Ukrainian forces from landing on an unspecified island in Kherson Oblast. Another mill blogger claimed that Ukrainian forces do not have an established presence on the east or left bank and that Russian forces control the approaches to the islands in the Dnipro River Delta. Ukrainian Southern Operational Forces spokesperson Humenyuk stated that Russian forces are constantly shelling Kherson and Bereslav rayons and are using guided aerial bombs to strike uh, Kizomis, which is 20 kilometers southwest of Kherson city, out of fear of a Ukrainian counteroffensive and Ukrainians landing on the east bank of the Dnipro. So that is to talk about a place to the south um, of, um, sorry, to the south of Kherson city which is there Akizmis is there southwest um that is being struck by those bombs but also you have Bereslav which is here the other side of Novokokovka and the dam um so that is that's the footage I've just shown you of those glide bombs taking out three buildings there so the aviation the Russian aviation must be pretty active around here hammering targets along the Dnipro river artillery duels are taking place but the U ukrainians are trying to take out the through counter battery fire the russian artillery systems all along this river and that is reflected in the heavy losses of artillery pieces that the russians have been uh, suffering on a daily basis anyway 
That is the frontline update uh, for today, the 10th of, of May. You're starting to see things maybe change in certain areas. Ukrainians have, have made some territorial gains in a few places. Vilshana uh, in Bakhmut, south of Bakhmut, and uh, just on the very edge of the Donetsk blast down here, P potential gains or could just be rejigging. But there, I, I think we, we will mappings i think is going to be pretty tough for me over the next month it already takes me long enough to do these and i can imagine during a counter offensive i'm going to be like pulling what few hairs i have left on my head out anyway uh thanks for watching please like subscribe and share take care and i will speak to you later